Supervised drug injection sites. The controversial idea fell apart in Colorado, though supporters now have a new reason to be encouraged. Next investigated a secretive group airing commercials on Nine News. And the most interesting thing happened right after that. Grand Friends, a kid's simple idea that people of all ages just don't want to be lonely. Drought is back in our state. Let's look at our chances of getting a big time snow season that might fix it. Next. Supervised drug injection sites in Denver. It only seems like that idea is done because behind the scenes and in other states, that idea of giving drug users a controlled environment for getting high, it is still being discussed. Democrats in the Colorado legislature did not have the votes to allow Denver to do it this past year. Our new Roy looks at whether that's changing. It went from loud to quiet, but the conversation about supervised use sites never stopped. If stigma, shame and incarceration worked with drug use, we'd have wrapped this up years ago. All that's done is drive use underground where people have gotten preventable chronic diseases. Now the volume is getting turned up again because of a federal judge's ruling out of Philadelphia that said a supervised injection site would not violate federal drug laws there. So I jumped up and down and clapped my hands because this is really great for the United States National Harm Reduction Movement. That ruling perked interest in Colorado including Lisa Rayville with the Harm Reduction Center, who first talked to the Denverite about this. <laughs> Denver City Council passed an ordinance for a similar program last year. I guess people thought that we went away, but we certainly did not go away. The U.S. Attorney's Office in Colorado was clear they still think the idea is illegal and that the judge's decision is not binding in Colorado and is likely to be appealed. The announcement that came out last week will not have a direct impact um, on Denver. Earlier this year, state lawmakers couldn't get enough support to waive a nuisance ordinance to open a pilot program. That problem is still lingering. While lawmakers are still talking about it, Democratic Representative Leslie Harrod said a new bill isn't actively being worked on. Well, we will introduce a bill, I think, if the votes are there. Fellow Democratic Senator Brittany Patterson, who championed for a safe use site earlier this year, learned a lot through the politics over this and thinks there's a lot of education that needs to be done before an idea like this can actually move forward and worries that the conversation around safe use sites are so divisive that it could be doing harm by bolstering stigma. So instead, Senator Patterson said that she is focusing on legislation that works on everything from education to treatment that she thinks will ultimately help more people. But she said that doesn't always get a lot of attention because mm -hmm. it's not the flashiest of headlines when it comes to the opioid epidemic. And this is complicated, but we've told people a bunch of times, two-step process. Mm -hmm. Denver has to say, yes, we want this, and then the state has to say it's okay. Yeah. The state couldn't get to okay, but whatever happened to Denver's agreement on this? Yeah, so that ordinance is still valid. It, it's not like it expired or anything, and we yeah. got hold of Councilman Flynn, who was the one no vote against this last year. He said they still would need the state to basically sign off on it, mm -hmm. but that would be something that he would also want to fight because he thinks there's better options like making naloxone more available versus a safe use site. With so many new people on city council, I wonder if they wouldn't want to discuss it again. Exactly. Too. All right. Thank you, Nusha. Our next question comes from confusion over the name of the Decker fire near Salida. It is not near Deckers, Colorado. Maureen, Laryland, and Mary all asked us about that. Wildfires are typically named for landmarks in the area where they start, and the fire burning near Salida is close to North Decker Creek. So firefighters called it the Decker Fire. It's about two hours from Deckers, which is near Sedalia, not Salida. Yes, yeah, confusing. The Decker Fire was started by lightning a month ago. It's burned 6,300 acres, and firefighters are just now beginning to get some containment. Tonight, it, we see a sign that even the people responsible for road safety in our state can use a refresher on the topic. A viewer sent us a photo of what appears to be CDOT's safety patrol on the phone while driving. CDOT says, yeah, it's people are supposed to make hands-free calls like the rest of us, and they're going to reinforce the rules with them. In the spirit of transparency, I should tell you, something that happened on this program cost Nine News quite a bit of money. What we did here was our jobs, journalism, and what happened next was interesting. Here's Chris Vanderveen to explain. Well, today's August 1st, but more importantly, it's Colorado Day. Ubiquitous is a word. We turn to other news now. A word not often found in newscasts. After a fire at an oil tank in North. But during the first week of August, you would not be blamed for using the word. A surprise medical bill can be traumatic. To describe her during breaks in our newscasts, her face was ubiquitous. Harder on us. 
with a scheme with called a scheme government called breaks government breaks with a scheme breaks called government doctor shortages. Doctor shortages. Doctor shortages. Every doctor shortages. Doctor shortages. Thirty second spots devoted to insurance bashing, all funded by a group paid for by doctor paid for by doctor patient unity. A group willing to pay the nine new sales department one hundred and eight thousand six hundred seventy five dollars to run ninety eight ads during that one week. According to Federal Communications Commission records reviewed by Nine Wants to Know, that payment represented the single largest ad buy by far within the Denver television market. It does and then, on August 6th... One thing, Dr. Patient Unity, your about section is lacking the about part. The Nine News News Department dared question who might be paying for all of those ads. But where did Dr. Patient Unity get the money? With no more than a P.O. box in Birmingham, Alabama attached to its FCC filings, Dr. Patient Unity represented the darkest of dark money in politics. It has yet to respond to any of my inquiries. Yet one week after our story aired, Dr. Patient Unity decided not to spend another dime with Nine News as it rolled out another ad. The money it pulled from Nine News started going elsewhere. 47 grand more with Channel 7, 42 grand more with 31, and nearly 100,000 more at four. Guess what story each has yet to do? Remind Senator Gardner that government rate setting could mean closed hospitals. And this isn't just happening here. More than a quarter million dollars for airtime across the Twin Cities. When CARE TV in Minneapolis aired an investigation. Texas Senators Cruz and Cornyn. And when KXAN TV in Austin, Texas did the same. A surprise medical bill. Dr. Patient Unity pulled its money from those stations as well, electing instead to spend more money with stations that have yet to question them. Yet to question why they have spent to date more than 30 $30 million nationwide to scuttle congressional attempts to eliminate surprise medical bills. Thanks to this New York Times piece, we at least know this is funded in part by a pair of private equity firms that employ doctors, doctors who don't like insurance companies. Memorial, do you copy Not that Dr. Patient Unity is doing anything wrong here. It's free to spend money wherever it wants. But if you're a journalist working at any one of a number of TV stations across the country still running these ads, stations still benefiting from your lack of curiosity surrounding the volume, the ubiquity of these ads, shouldn't you at least consider doing, I don't know, maybe something akin to a little journalism? For next, this is Chris Vanderbeek. If the folks upstairs in our sales department are upset about the lost revenue, they have not mentioned it to us, the journalists who work in the newsroom. And that is how things are supposed to function from an ethical perspective. Journalism separated from the influence of advertisers, even when it hurts the bottom line. Our recommendation tonight comes from next producer Erica. It's an article from our partners at Colorado Politics. It looks at Colorado's longtime shortage of foster families and specifically how a new federal requirement could make that issue worse. This law takes effect in January. It's new rules for the foster care system, but it's going to impact that existing problem in our state. I recommend you give it a read. We put a link on the next Facebook page. He's 10 years old, yet he's learning and leading well beyond that age. This year he is leading the education uh, with the first graders and I'm trying to hold back tears. <laughs> Even at this age, he's long had this idea about connecting young people and older Coloradans. A dry summer has brought back drought. We'll use a new tool to see if a big snow season is coming next.
ever seaman had a great idea at the age of six. Grand friends, his way to connect people across generations. So Everest is all grown up now, he's 10, and the young man from Aurora is being honored nationally for that idea, which had its first session of the school year at Fox Hollow Elementary this morning. The Grand Friend Project got started when my son was in first grade. I was about to go to bed and I told my mom, what if my class could come to Chelsea Place? And um, ever since the very first experience, it's been incredible, the way that the kids and the elders bond in such a short amount of time. Octopus mm. likes to eat crabs. Crab. Huh. I didn't Octopus. know that, did you? Every year since we've had classes come into the library and have um, a bus full of elders come and read. See it. Zip. Listening to the kids read, they're all so cute. <laughs> they're really good readers nowadays. They're quite advanced, I think, from when I went to school. When I was in first grade, I, I'm sure we didn't read as well as that. <laughs> what is your word? The other thing that we felt like was important with the Grand Friend Project was talking to kids about dementia, um, telling them what to expect from their grand friends, what could happen, um, just talking about kind of resilience in life and um, getting along with people who might be different than yourself. Contacts we make with the kids and get ready to read the stories to them. Oh yeah, I wouldn't do anything else. The connection between the elders and the kids is just amazing. As much as it gives to the kids who need that connection with grandparents and need that experience with older generations, the elders need it just as much. Ever's mom technically runs the group these days, but she says he's been pretty clear that he wants to give her the boot and run it all himself. <laughs> Our future in solid hands. Now you know a 50 degree temperature drop, a hard freeze and snow in October. It's not that unusual. It's just that it takes some getting used to that idea after a day like this. But many of you have heard from are excited about ski season and snow. So well, here you go. 78 today will be as warm tomorrow and Wednesday, but big changes with the storm up to the north and west of us. Got some cold air. It's going to come in here in a hurry on Wednesday night. It's going to bring temperatures down 50 degrees, bring significant snow to the mountains and a little bit of light snow to lower elevations. Denver out to DIA, probably less than a half an inch, but Denver South could see an inch or two of snow on the grass and on the roadway, something we haven't seen in a while. So tonight, calm, quiet and cool, but not as cold as last night at 43. That's your temp at the bus stop tomorrow morning. Sunshine close to 80, both Tuesday and Wednesday. Rain Wednesday night changing to snow Thursday. Light accumulation, big story is the cold. Hard freeze possible Wednesday night and or Thursday night. So time to think about the sprinklers and all of the winterization things we always talk about. Friday's dry but chilly, but the weekend, we saved the weekend with sunshine. Temperatures are back close to 70 on Sunday, Kyle. Kathy, thank you. So we did not get much of a break from drought conditions in Colorado. Just as soon as we celebrated that they were gone, they're back, now covering a quarter of our state. Tonight, meteorologist Becky Ditchfield gives us a new way to look at drought by looking at the rain and snow that we need. The National Climatic Data Center recently released something called a drought amelioration tool. And it's just a fancy way of saying, here's what we need to make the drought better or what could make it worse. Instead of using forecasted rain, this tool determines the future of the drought by either selecting climatological conditions, meaning normal rain or snow, or worst case scenario, meaning no precipitation at all. From there, you can select what you want to determine, like the chances that the drought will completely come to an end, and then select the time frame. Now, our drought conditions have improved dramatically since this time last year, but the odds of getting another epic snow year are not in our favor. And according to this new tool, if we just have normal rain or snow for the next month, the odds that we come out of this moderate drought are less than 2%. Precipitation is not the only thing to consider when it comes to Colorado's drought, and the map won't look like the drought monitor. So this tool is very preliminary, but it does give you a general idea. If we don't start getting above average rain or snow soon, this drought will continue to get worse. State climatologists aren't using that tool extensively now. They're still tweaking it, but it does help them put a, a time frame on drought estimates, and that tool is available for any of us to use online. Trying to prevent the next target rock, King Supers gets proactive in protection. 
Look what this eight-year-old from Castle Rock can do after one summer with Bob Ross. He just fell in love with it, and that's all he wanted to do for the rest of the summer. He's only been painting, honest to goodness, like three months. A One Kid Art Show, next. Kid from Castle Rock came home from a summer at Grandma's house with a whole new talent because Grandma introduced him to Bob Ross and now he's good enough to earn his own art show. Um, my black color I made with black, Prussian blue. He just blows us all away, absolutely blows us away. Um, eight. Put a little bit of white in there to marble it up. He's only been painting, honest to goodness, like three months. Mm. Scrape it right into there. You know, started painting like he told you this summer with his, his grandma, kind of bought him his first set of oils. Wanted something to do, so we went and um, bought some oil paints. My dad was an art teacher for 30 years, and then my mom ha got her degree to be an art teacher. You just kind of felt like he was kind of born with the talent, the way he picked it up. My grandma and um, videos of Bob Ross. They started a Bob Ross video, and I'm not kidding you. It was like the Northern Lights, and it was like his first painting. There's been plenty of paintings that he's done that didn't quite turn out right, and, and Bob Ross videos has instilled in him, it didn't matter. He enjoyed doing it. Just a big evergreen tree. I'm going to have my own art show at my school. His um, art teacher has been phenomenal. And she's um, worked with the school to put on his one-man art show because she recognized instantly that there was just such a unique talent. Yeah, I'm really excited. It's actually real soothing for me. Yeah, it's uh, super calm, and that's what I like about it. I think you would say that that's amazing and I love your work. Titus's one-man art show will be Thursday at Soaring Hawk Elementary in Castle Rock. Starts at 3.30 in the afternoon and it's open to the public.
So at some point, we are either going to stop putting huge rocks in the middle of parking lots, or we will all learn how to drive around them. But today is not that day, and we have new pictures to prove it. That and your feedback, next. The naming rights to Red Rocks. That's cool. Hey, if next wasn't on the air, who would be covering the epidemic of cars getting high centered on parking lot rocks in our state? We both know that it's a menace. So big ups to the King Supers at Elizabeth and Taft Hill in Fort Collins because they are getting proactive and professional about it. Why move the rock when you could just stick some shopping carts and caution tape around it? There's got to be a story behind that, but we called their office and didn't hear back. Next viewer name Amber saw this, reminded her of the infamous Target Rock. But we've seen so many of these rocks claim cars around our state. People, you got to get your heads out of your phones. You're lucky if you only hit a rock. I'm sorry. This was in Lakewood. Uh, they had to bring in a tow truck over the summer at the King Supers at Alameda and Wadsworth when somebody got stuck there. We finished with your feedback. Scott writes in to say, just watch the segment on Dr. Patient Unity, the group buying those ads. He says, I'm an old journalist and I'm impressed. Glad one local TV news team showed initiative and drive and well, ethics. Ken Broren writes in on Twitter, I'm a volunteer at the Great American Beer Festival. 
the most Colorado thing I was this weekend was running into Kyle on the floor of the convention center. Ken, it was very Colorado to see you too and a few other next viewers. Thanks for saying, saying hi. See you next time.